Well, that's the way a dry fit is supposed to go. If you do your homework, get the wood sized right, mill the dados first, and then drill and chop the mortises after, uh, and then fit the tenons to the mortises, and then the fit up process at the bench for shaving the insides of the mortise and smoothing off the cheeks of the tenons. And with a dry fit like that, the glue up is a breeze. Everything just slips together. There's only one way it can go. The parts are all labeled so that each custom fit tenon fits each custom fit mortise. All the pieces end up in the same place as I intended and I fit them in the first place. I'm going to go through all the steps that I used for making these doors in more detail when I build the new shop door out of the perfect pallet wood. That'll be a little ways down the road yet. But I wanted to show the process leading up to the glue up of these doors and then get to the purpose of the video, which is to show how to make repairs on this paint grade wood. You've seen through the process some of the pretty egregious knots and defects in the wood. It's paint grade soft maple and everything's getting painted so there's no need to get perfectly clear lumber. Why waste it on a door that's going to get painted? Save the pretty stuff for the pieces that are going to get stained. So once I've got these doors glued up and they're dry, I'm going to dive into the process I use for fixing defects in paint grade wood. And the process I'm going to show you for repairing these defects is basically the way I learned to do bodywork back in the late 1970s. It's all the same stuff. Um, proper preparation, proper application, and then a sequence of sanding steps will yield perfect results when it's painted over. Of course, this is no good for a stained material because there's no grain in the Bondo, but uh, paint grade, there's no grain necessary. So I'm going to fast forward through time to a point when the doors are dry, and then I'll go through the steps I use for repairing defects in paint grade wood to get a flawless finish on the end product. All right, well, these doors had overnight to dry. I got the clamps off. I cleaned up a little bit of extra glue on here. Then I'm going to get into patching the flaws in this paint grade maple so that these doors can come out with a perfect finish that they need for the project they're going into. First thing about flaws I'll say is that I always put them on a hidden side, a less prominent side of the piece. This is the top and the front of the door here. This goes into a mechanical room where the top and the back side will only be seen once a year, if that. Uh, this other door just has smaller pinholes. The biggest flaw is down in this corner uh, where there's some you know, bark or something like that. Uh, but I can fix all these spots with no trouble at all with the same process. Uh, here's a knot, a couple knots on the front, and those are acceptable for paint grade wood. Paint grade wood is noticeably less expensive and um, save the pretty stuff and the more expensive stuff for where it's going to show under a stained finish. So I'm going to jump right into fixing these. Um, I've already identified the spots, making note of the nature of the various um, defects. So I'm going to zoom in close with the camera and show you the steps I use for preparing these various spots for the filling process. I'll say that uh, for stuff that's a 32nd of an inch deep, just uh, rough spots in the grain, I'll use a wood filler because it dries quickly. But for any of these deeper defects, I'm going to use Auto Body Filler. The uh, brand name most recognized is Bondo. When Bondo is mixed properly, it'll set up to any depth. It's a catalyzed reaction. It's not waiting for air drying. So some of these spots where I've got a repair that'll be at least a half inch deep. It's no big deal. The Bondo takes care of it. And um, actually, the deeper it is, the better it works. So uh, I'll zoom in and go through the process for fixing these spots. One of my favorite methods for preparing these various spots is to use a solid carbide burr. These have a quarter inch shank that uh, often I put in a die grinder, but that's a little uh, specialized piece of equipment. And I want to show for the video that these can be used in a regular drill. And I'm just going to start out with a round burr for digging into this small knot hole here. I'm chucking it into a cordless drill. Have that on the high speed. And I'll just ream this out. What I want to do is make a gradual transition from the repair to the surface of the wood. I don't want sharp edges like this hole has now. Theoretically, I could just fill this hole up, but those sharp edges are going to telegraph through the finished paint. You can 
see how this bit wants to take off across the wood. So I'm just um, resisting that tendency with my hand and letting the tool do the work to dig out that little spot. And the repair itself will be a good eighth of an inch deep. That'll be thick enough to hide those sharp edges on that small hole down there. And I want the transition from the repair to the surface to be rough. I want it to be rough right out to the very edge. And gradual. So there's no sharp edges here. It's a smooth transition and the sharp edges are buried under enough uh, buried at a depth so that they won't telegraph through to the finished surface. I'll tackle this bigger loose knot next and I've switched to a little rougher carbide burr to dig this guy out. Um, what I don't want is any loose wood underneath there if I can avoid it. Uh, this knot doesn't go all the way through so I want to make sure if there's a, a piece that's going to work itself loose that I get it out of there now. An acceptable way would be to just drill a hole Take a drill bit and drill that out, but I'm going to use the carbide burr just to show how that works. And I'll link to these burrs uh, on the Next Level Carpentry Amazon Influencers page if you can't find them locally. Yeah, so that knot travels down underneath this other blemish here. I'm not sure what that is, but I want it to go away. So I'm going to mill this down a little bit, and I'll use another burr of this shape to get that part. This is solid wood here, but um, I can get a, a more consistent paintable surface by milling that down and putting a skim coat of Bondo in there. See how that knot kind of traveled underneath this blemish? I'm digging that out a little bit just to make sure it's sound in there. Sorry, it's hard to keep a good working angle and a good camera angle going at the same time. But I think you get the idea. A little handheld here, and you just kind of see the contour of this. And all the edges are uh, rough and they're not abrupt, they're tapered. And like I said, I don't really care about the depth because the bondo will set up to any depth and there's no shrinkage. I've got another small pinhole knot on this same door style here. So I'll go back to the small round burr for this one. It won't take much. When the bit takes off like that, I just create more work for myself. I got this little runner here. It's a lot easier to not do that when I'm not worrying about the camera angle. But I'm just anticipating the motion of travel generated by the bit when it's spinning and resisting it. It'll do for that. Another pinhole on the other side of this door. Same thing, it's got sharp edges. Where they could be filled, but they're filled better if I do a little prep work. I imagine training in a dental school is not unlike this in principle. The beauty of paint grade wood is that this whole piece is good, except for one little spot. And it's just a travesty to uh, downgrade or dispose of wood for, for a flaw this small, especially when the door's getting painted. Nothing to it. This repair, on this bottom corner and edge is a little bit different animal because of its location. And if I were just doing this repair and not shooting video, I would be careful to preserve this sharp corner use it to use as a reference edge when I'm filling the repair. But because I'm shooting video and I want to show you the technique I use for reestablishing sharp corners like this, when I grind this out, I'm going to actually uh, disrupt that edge and show you how to work around that because you're not always so lucky and have a reference corner to work with. I've switched back to this rough burr because I want to get a little depth here. I 
And again, this crack could just be filled, but then it would have sharp edges where it meets the surface. So I'm um, just routing it down a ways so that I have a smooth transition or a tapered transition between the repair and the finished surface. That's just a line in the wood. It's not an actual crack. I don't mind if the bit jumps around like that. It chips out loose stuff and gives a nice rough surface to the repair. Switching back to the fine burr to, to taper and even up that transition. Just want to make sure all that weak wood is out of there. But this corner is sharp and square coming into the repair and coming out of it. I'll max out the zoom here just so you can see the nature of that repair area. I like to use a piece of colored tape near all the repairs so that as I'm working and have a, bot, a batch of Bondo mixed up, I don't end up missing one little repair somewhere because I can't see it and then have to mix a whole nother batch of filler just for one little hole. I like to mix one batch and hit them all at once. So I've got all the small repairs prepped and marked and I like to save the best for last. So I've saved this top rail with these pretty significant defects uh, to prep and fill last. But now at least you know what's coming. And I'm beyond busy these days with life and work. And I just wish I was faster at shooting and producing videos because every day out in the shop, I've got cool stuff going on that I want to share with you guys. But it's going to be a while before I'm doing any repairs like this. So I interrupted schedule and everything just to shoot this process because it's so useful and effective. And I wanted you guys to see it. This coarse burr is really quick at hogging these things out. And I'll add a piece of tape on this one just as a reminder to preserve this sharp corner. I don't want to damage that if I can help it when I'm digging out this little wing of this repair area. See how there's loose wood in this knot. I want to make sure that's all dug out of there. The bondo will stick to the loose wood, but if the loose wood isn't sticking, the bondo will come off with it. There's a little bit of a fracture that goes down through that. There's a spider running around. But that fracture doesn't come out on the exposed wood anywhere, and I know that'll seal up just fine with the filler. Go back to the smoother bit. And these walls of this are a little bit steep, so I'm going to taper them back a little bit to ease the transition between the repair and the finished surface. You hear me keep saying that, it's just important for the best repairs. And a repair this big or this deep would be just impossible or ridiculous to use regular wood filler. You'd have to put coat after coat after coat. It would keep cracking and shrinking and just be totally impractical to repair. But you can see in this close-up, I hope, what the contour and the texture of that repair looks like. When it's all done, I get this little uh, bit track running off here on the wood. That's no big deal. That fills right in. But when I'm doing this without the camera and I can adjust my body position to control the movement and the direction of the pull of the drill with the bit, I get a lot less of this. So all we've got left is this Jumber Krakatoa over here, but uh, we'll dig it out the same way as all the rest. And you can get high speed steel bits and spurs like this, but with the prices of carbide and CNC manufacturing for making this stuff, this is a really practical solution. So there's some chunky bark in here and some other stuff, but 
I'm just going to dig in and get it out of there. Like I said, when I'm not shooting video, I'll put my body position so that the bit is pulling itself into the work instead of off onto the finished surface like this. But for you to see it in a camera, I've kind of got to use this angle and the bit wants to take off and make a mess of things. But the good news is, it doesn't matter. The wood all around the edges is stable. So I'm just chasing that crack down here a little ways till there's, I don't know, a good quarter or three eighths of an inch of filler on top of it, which will stabilize it and prevent it from ever affecting the finished surface. It also gives you an idea of the extent of the effectiveness of the effectiveness of a repair like this. The cameraman, he could walk around the other side and you could see more of what's going on here. Switch back to this egg-shaped burr for tuning up these edges. I think that'll do. Maybe with a little extra light from the drill, you can see what that prep looks like. Oh yeah, the last step for the prep is to use compressed air to blow any loose particles out from down in the repair area. If you don't have compressed air, get it. I mean, if you don't have compressed air, you can use a stiff wire brush to clean out and loosen any of those particles. I'll call this section of the video uh, Introduction to Bondo 101. Um, I'm using the Bondo brand. It's either Bondo or Bondont, I'm not sure, but I call it Bondo. Um, and it comes with a lid for mixing, but that's kind of ridiculous. A tube of hardener and the good stuff in the can. You can use any flat hard surface for a mixing board. I got this little uh, Michelangelo palette here. Very nice. I do ceilings. Um, because it's, um, it's smooth, it's hard, it's sh and it has sharp corners. So I use that for mixing. Depending on how long your Bondo is set on the store shelf, it might be runny on the top and stiff on the bottom, so do yourself a favor and stir it all the way to the bottom so you don't end up with an unusable glob underneath all that. I'm going to fix these spots, starting with the small, simple ones and getting to the edge and the Grand Canyon at the end. Uh, so I'm just going to mix up a smaller batch of this. Because it's a catalyzed product, you never ever want to get any of the hardener into the can. In time, it, one little drop will set up the whole can or else at least spoil it. But I'm going to get a glob here. And I'm going to go with a proverbial golf ball size glob, which is about like that, I'm going to say. Again, this is a lot harder and slower to do while shooting video. Let's call that roughly a golf ball size blob. And for Bondo 101, the rule of thumb is to use a one inch long ribbon or noodle of hardener for each golf ball size glob of filler. In hot, humid weather, use less. In cool, damp weather, use more. It's hot in the shop. I'm going to go a little bit light on the filler. For the most part, any amount will set that up in time, but you don't want to wait a week for it. I just love it when my camera shuts off like that. It says battery exhausted and shuts off. I don't get it. When I'm exhausted, I got to keep working. I don't know. Um, anyways, uh, so it's, um, I'm going a little light with the hardener because it's warm and dry in here. And uh, I don't want it to set up too quick, but 
um, five to 10 minutes is a good working time frame. So I'm gonna zoom in for the mixing. Here I've got a, a putty knife. You can use a plastic squeegee spreader. A, a Formica chip works well, um, but I use a putty knife when I can just because uh, it's firm and I can get the do job done quickly and effectively. But having a smooth surface to work with helps at this stage. I just kind of keep turning this over. The hardener in this can of Bondo is red. I've seen blue or green in different brands at different times, doesn't matter. But the key thing is to get an even mix of the material. So there's no streaks of gray in there. If you get a gray streak in the middle and you go to sand it, it's gonna be gummy for a week. So just get a nice, smooth, even mix. And you can see how having a sharp edge on the mixing board is quite beneficial for cleaning the knife and controlling the material. That material is setting up, whether you can see it or not, so I gotta move quickly. I'll slide over to this first repair so you can see it. The most important thing at this stage is to get a good mechanical bond between the Bondo and the wood. So I don't want to just put the material in like that and hope it's sticking underneath. I force it into all the texture in the wood like that so that I know it's really stuck. Then I push down like this. You can see it bubble up a little bit so I know that I'm filling any air bubbles in there. And what I want to do is make sure that the repair area is overfilled. If I, if I go smooth like this, by the time this sets up and I start sanding, it's going to be too low. I don't want that. So I make sure that I get it overfilled. I'm tipping the putty knife to make a mound of filler over that. If it's an eighth inch high, it's about perfect. It's not because of shrinkage. It's just because of the process needed for smoothing off this repair. I don't want any dips like that in there because then I have to mix a second batch to fill it. Better a little over full than under full at this stage of the game. Little guys are easy. Here's that bigger, deeper one. Same sequence of steps. I need to make sure it's got a good mechanical bond down in that hole. Stir it around, push it, smash it, whatever you gotta do. And you can just see that once once it's like that, if there was any loose dust on there, it's been absorbed into the filler. It's not going to cause a problem. There again, I'm kind of pushing down. You can see that Bondo bubbles up past the putty knife just from the pressure. That tells me I've got all the air bubbles out of there. And then I kind of put some English on this putty knife with a little bit of an angle. to make sure the repair is over full. And earlier in the video, I mentioned that Bondo actually works better when the repair is thicker. If I put a feather coat of this Bondo on something like this, that Bondo will set up, but the surface of it, when it cures, is kind of gummy. It'll gum up the sandpaper, and by the time I get done cleaning off the gummy part, all the filler is gone. So I try to make Repair is just a little bit thicker so they don't have to deal with the stickiness of the thin coat repairs. Here's a little guy, same process. And you notice how I'm not putting this on there and then leaving sharp edges. I try to taper everything like this by tilting the putty knife towards the center and making a little mound with tapered edges. The better you get at that, the easier it is later for sanding this and getting it to come out perfectly flush. Still got a little life left in this Bondo, but I don't want to spoil any of these fill jobs by flipping it over onto uncured Bondo. Let's get this little guy while well, we got some life left in here. I'm going to keep working until this starts to set up so you can see what happens when it's kicked off and it's doing it right now. It's not creamy anymore. You can see the texture on there. This comes out chunky and globby. I can probably get one more repair out of it, but if it's too globby, 
it's been too thick. It's hard to taper it and spread it. You can see what's happening here. I'm putting a lot of pressure on there to get that to taper out and smooth out. See how it knots up like that. So that's that batch is cooked and I end up just wasting what's left over. When I'm actually doing these repairs, it's easier to gauge the amount of filler and the time that I have to use it so that I don't waste so much. But now you know how this stuff behaves in a repair situation and what to expect. So the good news is this stuff is setting up all the way through whatever it's like on the surfaces, like in the middle and the bottom. So that once the repair is cured, it's cured all the way through. There's no shrinkage or movement after. If you're worried about such things, a pair of rubber gloves isn't a bad idea at this point. But other than playing with those blobs like their Play-Doh, I wouldn't really have any on me because I've contained the Bondo to the mixing pallet and the putty knife. While this stuff is curing out the rest of the way, I use a razor scraper. This is a really good one. I use it to clean up the Bondo on the pallet and the putty knife. You can clean it off later, but at this stage, it comes off nice and easy without a fight. And I want this material to set up just a little bit more before I do anything with it. And actually, I'm going to let these repairs cure out until they're good and hard and ready for sandpaper. I'll overfill some of these other deeper spots and show you how to use a sureform plane or a cheese grater for the initial preparation step. And just so you know, if I wasn't filming, I would just mix one batch of Bondo and hit all these repairs with one coat right at the beginning. Uh, it's a quick enough process that I can mix that filler and do it all at once. But because of the explanation with the video and everything, my time is delayed and I want to show a little more detail of the steps. But for a project like this, it's one batch of Bondo and just a couple of minutes to fill all these things up. You'll see how I sand them and clean them up. And uh, this, these repairs uh, probably would take a half an hour in condensed form uh, in reality. So um, it's not as big a deal as it looks like in the video. Before I mix up the next batch of Bondo, I'm going to do one more little piece of prep work here. I'm taking a piece of decent masking tape and putting it along the edge. And I'm holding it about an eighth inch higher than the corner. This will act as a form to hold the filler in place. I can just flare this edge out and back so that the filler does everything it needs to along that edge. When doing detail work, I'll also use masking tape to keep Bondo from going anywhere I don't want it. I don't want to have to clean up Bondo from that corner there, so I'll just throw a piece on there. If this was a detailed molding, like a, an OG or a roundover, and there's a sharp corner, I'll just block off the tight little areas where I don't want Bondo to go, because it's a lot easier to keep Bondo out than it is to get it out after it's set up. And even though I've never played a legitimate round of golf in my life, and I'm not a golfer, I still think in terms of golf balls when it comes to mixing Bondo for these three repairs. I'm thinking it takes you know, a couple golf balls worth. This is maybe, uh, it's two for sure, maybe a little more. I'm going to go about two inches. That's going to be plenty. It's going to take off pretty quick. Well, the drawback of Bondo is that it's not stainable. So if you're doing any woodwork or repairs of wood that are going to be a stained finish without some kind of a toner to mute it out. You just have to patch with real wood. But for this sort of repair, it cannot beat this stuff. It's stinky, so wear a respirator if that bothers you. Fresh air is a good idea. I always clean right down to the palate to make sure every stitch of it is good. For this edge repair, I'm folding the tape back working some Bondo in along that edge to make sure that there's a good transition between the repair and the wood. And then getting a good mechanical bond on top, push that form back into place, and I'll load this baby up. Like I said, I'm going to leave this extra fold just to show you another process I use for this sort of repair. But I still want to try to get a tapered blend between the repair and the finished surface. But this, uh, I want to make sure that the corner of Bondo is out and beyond the corner of the wood. So when I sand it down, 
I end up with a crisp corner that continues right in this line. I'll get this guy next. This is an ideal prep because it doesn't go out into the edge. It's all self-contained. It's easy to fill. Everything is sound down in there. I got this one runner that takes off where that carbide tool took off on me. I'll just make sure I get some filler out there. Wad this guy up. And I could use a wider putty knife to span that and, and get a repair that I could start by sanding with uh, sandpaper. But as it is, I'm going a little crazy with this stuff just to show you how it is to work with. And I might have shorted myself filler for this last repair. I do believe I did. So I'm short filler for this one. I'll try to mix up a little and get it put in here before this sets up so that I can clean it up all at once. Actually, I'm just going to overfill one end of it here so that this batch can all go off at the same time. And this way you can get an idea what a two coat repair looks like because you don't always get it right the first time. You can see this stuff is turning into jelly pretty quick, which is just what I'm looking for. Well, I juiced up that batch pretty well. It is setting up quickly and nicely. Let's peel this form off there while the bondo is still a little pliable this guy off. That way I have my corners all nice and clean and I didn't have to sand it to get it there. So I'm just looking for a, a kind of rubbery consistency, not gummy. And I'm using a Sureform plane, aka a cheese grater, to shave this mound off and get started on the repair process. You can see how a curved profile works better on a flat surface. And what I don't want to do is go too far with this step. I'm just taking off the darker texture of the material on the surface and you can't see it but I can feel that there's a mound here it's probably a sixteenth of an inch thick I don't want to scratch the surrounding wood otherwise I'll have to do more repairs look at this one while I'm at it and I know I'm going to recoat this one so I'm a little less concerned about taking too much off you can see how I'm using a little bit of a crosshatch stroke there here again this end has got a nice little mound to it and we're on a deficit on this end but that's no big deal We'll use our last coat to fix that. Now in this corner one, I'm using a, a flat cheese grater and just shaping this edge. Sometimes pulling is better than pushing. And I want to make sure that I don't take the repair too far. And I just had a boo-boo there. That bondo was a little fresh and that corner broke off. But that was good wood underneath there, so I don't have to worry about it. But just bear in mind that if you get after this too quick, it'll roll up and crumble like this. You can see how it wants to come loose. But that's really no big deal because you can always second coat. I'm taking the cheese grater again. It doesn't work very well if you use it backwards. You can see how this gets the shaping process started nicely. Gives you a nice flat surface. And the other thing the cheese grater is doing, you see how it gums up a little bit because the surface of this cured Bondo is tacky. And if you take right after this with sandpaper, it just gums up the paper and doesn't cut very well. This repair was from the first batch. It's kind of too hard for the cheese grater to do much, but it is cutting off that darker surface, which is the tacky part. This is dry and sandable in the middle. Once the, once the stuff is thoroughly set, give it extra time. It'll, it'll get hard and untacky by itself. But it really works well to do the initial shaping with a cheese grater because it saves so much time and sandpaper. And anybody that knows me knows I hate sanding. It's not absolutely necessary um, to re-rough this up. Bondo will stick to itself marvelously, but I'm just going to get some of the loose and rough edges off here before I add that final batch. If I was to use the fine cutter, it would just gum it up because this is still pretty flexible. The main thing is that I want a surface that I can get a good me mechanical bond with that last coat. And I'm sure that with Murphy's third law of overcompensation, I'll end up with 
about as much left over as I was short on the last batch. And I get a good mechanical bond into those edges. Everything's good. Let's feather this out. I can go right over that first coat. It's no big deal. It's way more than I needed. I'm just going to wob it in here to emphasize the point of the importance of getting after this stuff with the cheese grater as it's setting up. A mistake you'll only make once is forgetting that you got Bondo setting up and this stuff gets rock hard so that you can't cut it off with a cheese grater and you have to sand it all down with sandpaper. That sort of experience is the best teacher. I guess that's enough fussing. What I was trying to do is make sure that I didn't have a dip out in the middle there and have to do yet another coat. All right, with the right amount of hardener in there and a warm shot, that doesn't take any time at all to set up to the point it's ready for the cheese grater. You can't feel this in the video for some reason, but this stuff actually warms up as the catalyzed reaction takes place. The thicker the patch, the warmer it gets. Here again, I'm using the curved sure form for this flat surface. I'm trying to remember which way the blade is installed in there so that I'm using it the right direction. You see there's a sharp edge on this side. It's harder to make that disappear than these tapered edges. But I'm leaving this with just a gentle, solid mound in the middle before I move on to the first step in the sanding process. Well, I've let a couple hours go by, so this Bondo has gotten really hard. Uh, and put it in place and shaved it with the cheese grater and then just let it set up because I had time. Uh, on a typical project, you can wait 10 or 15 minutes till the Bondo gets hard so it doesn't gum up your sandpaper and then it's ready to sand through the grits to get it to a finished smoothness for uh, accepting primer and paint. Again, I hate sanding, so when I'm sanding, I want to do it as quickly and efficiently as, and uh, painlessly as possible. So these are the tools I use when I'm sanding. I have a couple of these sanding blocks, which is a nice handle. This spring clip holds uh, sheets onto the sanding block. The sanding block is a piece of aluminum, so it's stiff and flat, which is exactly what is needed for getting a good job on this sort of thing. Uh, on one of these sanding blocks, I've got a piece of 36 grit underneath, and I just slip a piece of 80 grit on top of it. And on the other sanding block, I've got a piece of 150, and there's actually a few layers of it on here. These extra worn out layers puts a little bit of give into it, but not too much. So with the two sanding blocks, the only other thing I really need is a hacksaw blade a common hacksaw blade, and that's the handiest thing to have around when you're sanding Bondo. You'll see why in a minute. With all my toys in place here, uh, we'll go through the sanding process. I'm going to do three spots. This simple easy one here, and then I'll do the edge, and then the Grand Canyon over on that other door. All right, to start the process, uh, remember when I was putting this on, I stressed the fact of mounding the filler a little bit. You can see it in the way this knife rocks. That's a good amount for it to uh, be rocking. I'll start out with sharp 36 grit paper and I'll sand flat across the top of that mound. Uh, what I don't want to do here is hit the face of the door with the 36 grit very much because uh, then that's just more sanding that has to be done to get those scratches out. As soon as the grit starts getting close to the wood, then I just flop the 80 grit over and use it. And use as sharp of sandpaper as you can afford at this point. This is good 3M sandpaper. Uh, some of the brown stuff you get at the hardware store. One rub across the material and all the grits on the wood and all you got on your sanding block is paper. So get the good stuff. Um, the 80 grit scratch is okay on the wood. So the second phase of sanding is to take this from being a slight mound to having it level. But I don't want to be seeing the margins of the repair yet. Um, I want to be able to tell where they are, but I don't want to sand down till they're visible because then uh, the final sanding step will make the repair too low. So this is probably the most critical step. And the first thing I'm going to do is sand away these lines where the bondo ends and the wood begins. and the better job you do in placing the filler like this where it's feathered instead of an edge like this, 
the easier this stage is. And going in a crosshatch pattern with the sanding is always a good idea. And you can start to see the perimeter of that repair area. Looks like I got a little heavy with the filler on this side. And I'm trying to shave that mound of filler off. I'm not trying to round it off. I'm trying to cut the top off so it comes flat to the wood. And I hope you can see this in the camera. I'm going to zoom in a little bit more. So you can see the margins of the repair right there. And then just a skim of Bondo um, on the surface of the wood as I kick the leg of the camera. So the last step in this is to use the 150 grit. And all this is doing is removing the 80 grit scratches from the wood. There's a few 36 grit scratches over here that I need to take care of. But I'm being careful not to sand through the filler because I don't want that to dimple out. And that's about all there is to it. No more mound here. This is perfectly flat. And once that gets a coat of primer, that repair is invisible. I'm going to spin this around, see if I can keep this from crashing to the floor. This will be a little trickier to video because of the nature of the repair. I'm going to do the edge first. And because there's so little sanding to do, I'm going to start with 80 grit instead of going down to 36. Just takes a few wipes to get that where it needs to be. So this edge is flat and smooth. We have a flat plane with a sharp corner at the top, but the corner is uneven because of the filler on this top surface. I'm going to flip the 80 grit out of the way, go to the 36. And what I want to do is make sure that I'm sanding from this wood off onto the surface. If I start sanding over here and I wear that corner down, it's going to take another coat of filler to get this straightened out. But as it is, I probably can't see that, but there's, there's a mound of filler here. So I just need to be careful in approaching the sanding. Let's see if I can get a good angle for the camera and for the sanding block. Because of the work I did with the cheese grater, I've, I don't have very much to do here at all. And I want to remove the bulk of that extra filler because it's so much easier to do with 36 grit than 80. I just start to see the wood through there. It's perfect time to switch. And now I'm going to sand from the wood onto that repair so that it ends up in the same plane. And I'm feathering the edges down as I go. And now I got a very sharp corner and a nice flat repair. All but this little bit of excess filler is gone. I'll switch to sharp. Uh, 150 grit, smooth out the wood, make sure that make sure that any heavy scratches in the wood are cleaned up by sanding the wood and not out on the filler. If I was to just go after this, uh, the filler would dish out first. It sands a little differently than the wood. When you get practiced at this, you'll be able to bring this down at exactly the right rate and time. If you go too far, you've got to put another layer on there. And that thin layer is hard to sand because it gets gummy. And if I go handheld here in the light, you can see how sharp that corner is. I'll actually knock it down so that the paint will stick. And you can't tell in the camera, but when I rub my hand on here, there's no difference in the level of the surface as it transitions from wood into filler. And that's the goal of a good repair. All right, the last one I'm going to do is this big one. Remember, this was a half inch deep and about six inches long. I could have sanded this 20 minutes after I got done. Uh, if I used any other kind of filler that was air dry, we'd still be waiting and recoating. Because I was able to use the cheese grater on this, 
the surface is really close. There's not much rocking in here at all, but it is a mound instead of a dip. And remember when I was putting the filler on, I ended up with a good extra eighth of an inch. It was a big glob because I didn't want to have a, a divot out here in the middle. But the cheese grater just takes that excess material off and ensures that I don't end up with a divot that I have to recoat. And I push the 36 grit just as long as I can, but I'm better off switching to 80 grit too soon and having to sand more than I am getting scratches out here that I have to recoat and resand afterwards. If you don't use a cheese grater on a repair like this, you might spend a good three or four or five minutes sanding it down to this point. Notice I'm sanding away any sharp edges. They're not really sharp, but like this. I'm sanding that first to get everything to feather out nicely into the into the wood while there's still a little mound of filler here. And I'm actually putting pressure on the side of the sanding block as I go around so that I sand the edge and don't take the middle down too quick. That probably won't make much sense until you're actually working on one of these and you get a feel for it. And the repair was long and skinny this way so I'm sanding across it to bridge it and not if, um, if I had the sanding block tipped like this I could re-gouge out the middle of that but if I sand across the sander will kind of ride on the wood on either side and have less of a tendency of digging down in the middle. All right, this is not that good of an example because this is brand new sandpaper and the bondo was really dry. But you can see here on the sanding block where that the bondo is starting to cake and pack into the sandpaper. That's where the hacksaw blade comes in. A quick slap wrap with that hacksaw blade pops that stuck on body filler out of the sandpaper and renews its life. And that may well be the best tip of the video. I've got this where I want it. Everything's nice and flat. I'm just beginning to see the wood through here. There's a little extra filler on the surface, but you can see the secondary repair over here. And I don't know if it shows up in the camera, but you can see the colors. It looks like the second coat of Bondo, I used a little less filler. It's lighter in color than the first coat. You can see a dark and a light there maybe. Uh, but I'll finish this up with 150. And that'll do it. Nothing to the repair. And once that's got a coat of primer that's sanded and a coat of paint, that big old fissure in the wood is just gone. As long as I got the camera running, I'll do this last repair here, which was a pretty deep one if I remember right. There's a sharp edge here that I, I left too strong, so I've got extra sanding to do on that side. Finish up with 150. Something like that. You can see where the tooling made those little extra tracks in there, but they're now filled in and flush. And I don't know if it shows up in the camera, but there's a rough spot right there. A couple pinholes here. And there's one over on this repair too. They're real shallow. Uh, it was just from waves in the Bondo. Maybe I got too aggressive with the cheese grater, but those need to be dealt with. If they were bigger or deeper, I would use Bondo, but because they're just almost superficial. I'm going to rough them up with a little bit of sandpaper to define them. Same thing with this one. I wish I didn't have to show this to you as in if I had done an absolutely perfect job of processing that filler, but it's probably a good thing to see how to deal with these. Um, like I said, when the Bondo is put on in a thin layer, it's mostly sticky. By the time you get done sanding through the sticky spot, it, you're pretty much sanded through the repair. So I'm using this Elmer's Carpenter's Color Change Wood Filler. This is awesome stuff. It comes purple. This has been around a little while, even though I used my smoogers on it. But it's very uh, dense and it dries quickly. And because the, the repair is so shallow, it, um, it doesn't shrink or anything. Again, I'm even with this filler, I'm making sure I get a good mechanical bond in there. I'm using a lot of pressure. And feathering that repair out. This stuff will turn light in color in about 15 minutes by the time I get done doing the Bondo repairs on everything else. And I'll come back and scuff that off there with 150. And I think that uh, part of the lesson is valuable. 
if you get a little too carried away with the sanding and you end up a 64th of an inch shallow and you can feel those repairs, you can use this filler for a skim coat in addition to it and um, it just works great. If I was in a hurry, I could speed that up with a industrial strength hair dryer. Well, I hope I shot all the footage I needed to show how to repair paint grade wood with auto body filler with Bondo. I'm going to try to whip up this video, finish the production on it, and get it uploaded so you can see how this works. With these pocket doors, I'm also installing some pretty high class pocket door pull hardware. And so you'll get to see these again when I show the steps I use for uh, making quick and accurate templates for mortising in the fancy hardware for these doors. Yeah, I guess I'm just rambling. I'll wrap up this video. I want to thank everybody for watching. If you find this sort of thing helpful, I hope you'll consider subscribing to Next Level Carpentry if you haven't already. It's free, and as time goes on, I try to get more and more content like this uploaded, and hopefully it's helping people uh, like you figure out new ways of doing things a little better, a little faster, and a little easier. But I'll finish sanding these things up, uh, put stops in here, put that hardware in, etc. And uh, we'll see you next time. And in the meantime, until then, thanks for watching. This probably wouldn't all be so bad if I didn't hate sanding so much. Yeesh.